first of all, hear from uh, Adva Rodogovsky, WJR's Ukraine program manager. Uh, Adva has the uh, delightful task in managing WJR's 44 programs in Ukraine, supporting over 16,000 vulnerable individuals. And Adva's going to outline steps WJR have taken and are taking to mitigate against an ongoing crisis in the country. Adva, over to you. So, as Paul said, we have 44 projects in Ukraine. Uh, we're investing two and a half million pounds annually for 2013-14. And we work with the most vulnerable communities in Ukraine. And we are geographically very spread from west, central, east, and south. We don't work in Crimea, though. Um, and our project target uh, welfare assistance to elderly, home repairs, supporting people with disabilities to integrate into their communities, and livelihood development projects, which are targeted at those who are either underemployed or unemployed, uh, supporting them. So um, I want to talk about two aspects. First is my impression of how the crisis affected our beneficiaries. Julia will give her personal uh, impression from Kiev, and then I will say some something about what WGR is doing in the past few months. So first, I would say that miraculously, and I don't know how, but I think a lot of it is thanks to the really hard work of our partners, programming is going ahead as planned. So despite the internal conflict, despite the Russian intervention in, in Ukraine, our programmings are doing well uh, as they are planned. Um, partners have disclosed a multitude of views uh, as both Dr. Finin and Emilia has um, illustrated. And then, um, I mean, there's people in Kiev and people in Kharkov, and they have all those ideas, and our partners in Kiev actually were very active in Maidan, themselves participating, either sleeping in tents or volunteering or, you know, donating medicine and moving around. And whereas our partners in East and South regions have more kind of cautious opinions and they're generally expressing less, less trust in, in any process uh, in, in the new government. And it's been a very interesting kind of uh, period when I talk daily to partners in East and West Ukraine and South Ukraine and, and hearing complete different opinions about any event that is happening um, in interesting times. Um, I can say that um, the last couple of weeks, uh, I've, been to, I've been to Ukraine twice in the last two and a half weeks. Uh, first, first time uh, on the day Yanukovych fled and was uh, oust from the parliament and a week after was after Russia actually invaded military uh, to Crimea. And the sense in the streets is a mixture of shock and disbelief. Um, Ukrainians are quite peaceful by nature as a country, and they're not used to violence in the streets. And the idea of violence is very foreign to our partners. And Julia, actually, um, sorry, you might have wanted to say that, but I'm stealing that line from you. She asked me to think of a 92 years old elderly like war veteran in, in Ukraine watching the news and watching Germany ask Russia to refrain from attacking Ukraine. And this is kind of the mindset of many of our elderly beneficiaries. And that was very powerful for me to understand the mindset of, of some of our beneficiaries. As the internal conflict, the internal political conflict at Maidan did not affect a lot of our partners in the east and south region of the country, but ever since the Russian military intervention, now everyone experiences very high level of anxiety and fear, and it's, it's uh, also in Kiev, in Kiev it's also mixed, a mixture of celebration alongside that. So um, on the daily life of our beneficiaries, and Alan here, kind of portrayed the, the dire economic state of the country, and that does affect uh, our beneficiaries, and there have been delays in pensions both in February and March, and frail elderly and people with disabilities are struggling. If, even if the pensions it is delayed in a one or two weeks, that is that have an effect on the daily life of beneficiaries. And there are rumors of the country not being able to pay pension or state salaries in the next few months, and that increases the level of fear and anxiety. Of course, the dev devaluation of the Grivna and the inflation and the increase of food prices, so far only 13%, but um, that actually, our beneficiaries are decreasing their purchasing power. 
So um, that does affect our welfare clients. Um, although at the moment, WGR does not assess that to be an economic crisis, but we are closely monitoring the situation. And as for non-welfare clients, which is like most of our uh, programming is for not necessarily for welfare clients, so we have our LDP graduates. Um, LDP are employment uh, kind of projects supporting livelihood, uh, livelihood uh, through employment and supporting people to get back to employment. So some of our graduates have lost their jobs. This is what mainly in Eastern South Ukraine uh, because businesses have sh uh, kind of kind of, um, they had shortcuts and they cut down the operations and people, people were not being paid, either state workers and also private people who work for private companies. So this is very recent. This is only for the last couple of weeks. We haven't heard that uh, in, since November. This is very, very recent in the last, very last few weeks uh, that we've been reported that there are there's much more struggle in getting employment and, and the people are being let, let go of and et cetera. And other than that, in terms of banking, we only had one incident where money got lost and then was found, but that was very an isolated incident, incident, but it might kind of point into something which potentially can be more dramatic than that. Um, so what we've done so far, and for us, the most important thing for World Jewish Relief is to make sure that programming are uh, carrying on and continued as planned, and we support our partners to do that as best as we can. And we really want to understand how the crisis affects the people we already support, and um, that in terms of medical treatment, in terms of food, in terms of kind of emergency medical treatment and other basic needs that we anticipate might be in need. Uh, in the future. So we conduct daily monitoring of the events as they develop because they move geographically uh, from Kiev to Crimea to southeast Ukraine. So we kind of keep track on, on the development and the escalation of crisis. We have, I conduct daily phone calls to partners, both in east and west and south of the country. And we monitor daily monitoring of pension and state salaries to see if they're being paid or not. We monitor prices weekly to see to kind of track the increase of food and medical items. Uh, we can, I can tell you that food has increased in about 13%. Some of the medicine have increased in 30, 40, and 50% because most of the medicine is imported, and that is affecting a, a lot of our elderly clients that cannot afford medicine at the moment. Um, we have done um, monitoring trips. I've been to Ukraine four times since November and twice in the very recent uh, weeks and it's been it's exciting times in Ukraine and um, very, very, <laughs> very strange times in Kiev. Uh, we have been talking to a lot of journalists and political scientists and think tanks and, and politicians, even Svoboda Party, just really trying to understand uh, what's going on in the country, hearing as many people as I can, and that with that kind of influence our scenario planning at the World Jewish Relief, uh, that we're really tracking the situation, deciding when will be the time that we will decide to intervene more meaningfully. Um, so as I said at the moment, uh, in terms of economic crisis, we don't perceive this to be a catastrophe. And our partners as well, they monitor the economic uh, situation of our clients, and at the moment they support case-by-case -case intervention uh, for particular families or elderly, or single elderly or person with disability. Um, and what else there? Yeah. So we are perceiving, we are, we are actually expecting an increase of caseload of, of uh, especially in the welfare projects, as people are actually falling below the disability and uh, sorry, the vulnerability line and will be less and less uh, able to sustain themselves. Also, people who are graduate of our employment schemes might find themselves again un unemployed or underemployed or not paid or maybe employed and not being paid. So we may need to kind of intervene there. Um, and we also, of course, we don't work in Crimea, but we do follow closely the events in Crimea. Uh, just, I think it's interesting to see what does it mean there in terms of banking and currency and kind of authority and the citizenship and this, the whole thing is very unique. It's very interesting to see what's happening there and the might 
be a, f uh, a flood of refugees or displaced people coming out of Crimea, people who don't want to live there, and there we might want to kind of offer support to these people. And of course, there's still a possibility of, of a you know, hot war between either Ukraine or Russia or an international, which seems very unlikely, uh, but it's still in the cards, and we don't know what Russia's next move is going to be, so we're closely monitoring that. And one thing about uh, anti-Semitism, and Amelia did speak about that, so I, I will not repeat that, but we do kind of monitor uh, events, and so far there's been sporadic events, and we do understand that to be part of the breakdown of law and order in the country, not necessarily as an orchestrated attack on Jews, and Jewish partners, uh, they insist that there is no increase in anti-Semitism as far as they, Jewish partners in Ukraine, uh, that as far as they understand that. Uh, we do agree that any attacks on the Jewish community do not reflect a large-scale increase in anti-Semitism, but we do monitor carefully uh, and to determine our parameters of when will, when will we think differently and when will be a better kind of time to, to do something more proactive. Um, We've also committed additional 200,000 pounds grant for SOS uh, in anticipation of an increase in demand. And we've increased our commitment to elderly welfare programs and so that we can be able to meet the needs of vulnerable elderly. And we've set uh, a crisis fund, which will enable us to do more in case uh, there's gonna be a need for that. So I can say that partners really appreciate our solidarity. Uh, they really appreciate us going and visiting, and I'm sure they will appreciate that 120 people came here today to hear about them and kind of show their support. And they do support our, more, our work in monitoring efforts. We cannot do the programming or the monitoring without our partners in Ukraine, and I'm very grateful for all our partners there. Reality changes though rapidly, and many, many things are unpredictable, and there's a lot of, kind of fear and, and, and stress amongst all of our partners, and we, no one is sure where this, where this is heading. And yeah, at the moment we assess, again, this is not a humanitarian crisis, but unfortunately this could turn into one any day now, so we are tracking, sure. Well, thank you very much.